My first inoculation was Dr. King. And then that led me to Adam Powell and a lot of the people. But I was put off by Malcolm X. Why? Because what he was saying and the way he was saying it was too blunt. It was dangerous. And you didn't say those things in those days. I told you, we had been socialized as kids to get around wrong, not to confront it. And Malcolm spoke in very declarative terms, and he said some terrible things about white people that we thought, but you would never express it, you see. He talked about the way this country was not a democracy, but a hypocrisy. And he talked about what had been happening to us down south and up south. And he was not shy. <laughs> he had a, a, and he was very, very uh, intimidating. I'm man enough to admit it to a lot of people who are my age who will speak, you know, with love about Malcolm as though it had always been that way. But that's not so. He scared a lot of us to death. And then, mind you, I had this apartment, a bachelor apartment on Convent Avenue, and I had been having a lot of fun, you know. And here he comes talking about a different way of life. First of all, he dropped his last name. Well, we had been socialized to take great pride in our last name. The more European it sounded, the better. There was not a, a flinch about, you know, noble, oh, that's wonderful. If it wasn't French enough, you'd put an ETT on it, you know, to make it sound more French. And so here's a man who dropped his good last name and replaced it with an X. I thought the man was crazy. And then he, he talked about discipline. And he talked about self-discipline. Self-discipline. He said that we do not believe in drinking. And at the time, I would have a taste. And he said that we don't smoke cigarettes with or without a label on them. And I would smoke, you know, with a label. Yes. And he said, we don't eat pork. Well, <laughs> you know, I love me some ribs. <laughs> and then he said, we don't fornicate. Yes. <laughs> and so psychologically, I said, Malcolm, I'll see you later. <laughs> Yes. You know, and all. Because, but what he was doing in deprecating whiteness, I came to understand later that he was rearranging the balance that we needed because we had glorified whiteness mm -hmm. and deprecated blackness. And so he was tilting, using exaggerated term, to give us a sense of self and to take whites down a little as they needed to be. And the discipline that we, he was talking about were things that we really needed to address. But I couldn't swallow that at, at the time. So jumping forward in time, um, a lot of things happened uh, in the struggle. And Malcolm was struck down in 65. And I never went to hear him speak. My only impression of Malcolm was on the sound bites on the evening news. Mm. And um, if there was a rally in Harlem, where I'm living now, I'm living in Harlem, and he would have a rally 10 blocks away, I would go in the other direction. Did because he have I didn't, a mosque there? He had a mosque on 116th Street, mm -hmm. and I didn't live too far away from there. But I went out of my way to avoid this man because I thought he was wrong. I had white, uh, a white friend who was going to Princeton. And he called my wife and I one weekend, and he said, could you put me up over the weekend? Because Malcolm X just came down to Princeton. And I never heard anything like that in my life. Blue eyes, pale yes. skin, blonde hair. Could you put me up? I said, well, you can come on up here if you want to, you know. So he came up, and Sunday morning, he said, OK, I'm ready to go to the Rockland Palace. And we lived maybe four blocks from the Rockland Palace at the time in the projects. And he said, okay, let's go. I said, what do you mean, let's? <laughs> you know? And so we had a big argument. I said, I'm not going to go there. Do you realize what he's been saying about you and your people? That's, that's anathema to me. And we had a big argument. And he walked off and went down there on his own. And he came back whiter than when he left.
<laughs> I bet he did. Because he said that he had been put in a segregated section with no chairs. The white people had to stand. And Malcolm came out there and poured boiling oil over their whiteness, informationally. It was more intense than what he had done at, at, at uh, Princeton, because in Princeton he had just demolished the heads of the academic departments there, theology, history, and whatnot. But here he was talking in more graphic terms, and he really gave uh, this fellow Don Emerson, who we were friendly with, uh, a shellacking. I said, I told you you shouldn't have gone. And I said, I, the man is crazy, and I don't know why on earth you felt... You. And I was arrogant yes. in my ignorance. And it wasn't until 1965, when he was assassinated, that there was a brother who lived in the projects, and he called me aside and he said, um, I'll tell you why, Malcolm was killed. I said, what do you mean? He said, coming up to my apartment. So I went and he gave me a recording he had made of Malcolm uh, at one of his speeches. And so for the first time, I heard Malcolm unedited uh -huh. in context.